The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Um, I'm sitting here today in 125 Little Flinders Lane, just above Chin Chin for all the foodies. I did actually make it upstairs. Um, I know that when the uh, you see photos of myself, you you may think that I also made it back downstairs. But I'm here today with Drew Meredith, the Managing Director of Waddle Partners. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. I think you can smell the the food coming up the stairs already. Yeah, it'll be the, the, it'll be the shortest podcast. So um, if you're listening to this, it's, we're already halfway through, everyone. If there's a knock on the door. It's lunch. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. But um, jokes aside, um, Drew, you very graciously allowed me to um, host actually out of your podcast studio, which is, you know, I think the best way of explaining yourself and asking you to give us an idea of how you've got to be the managing director of, of, a, of a quality um, a financial advice practice, but you're much more. The fact I'm sitting inside what looks like a media studio inside uh, in your building probably indicates that more. So what I'd love to hear about is how you've got to where you are, because you've got a 20-odd year plus, plus 19. Um, 19, okay, <laughs> okay. Year on that. <laughs> I've got a nerve. Um, you've got a, a history there, you know, and where you've got to today and um, sometimes we'll reflect is it where you thought you were going to be? So, yeah, where, where'd you kick I don't off? Think, I don't think anyone th- is, thinks that we're that where they thought they'd be in the end. There's a little bit of crazy. Yeah, we've, got a, I think we've probably got a good backstory. So, Jamie Nemesis, my business partner, uh, we actually met at the local football club in, in Ivanhoe in Victoria. So, uh, fess up because this will polarise the audience. We're about, we're about <laughs> oh, to alienate yeah, half well, of Victoria. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah, it applies everywhere else as well. Uh, we met playing uh, football back in the early 2000s and um, we had a similar background in financial financial services. So, I started at the Commonwealth Bank, like I think so many people do. They attend the graduate program and that was where financial advice was. And we all know from what happened since uh, that they they were a great breeding ground for financial advice, but not necessarily the best um, long-term business models. And Jamie spent a lot of time at AMP before that. Uh, So, we've had a 18, 19-year career together uh, in many different formats. So, there was a business that was bu- uh, built and then sold and then we restarted that again. And when, when was the restart? What what year? Uh, middle of, or just after GFC. So, 2010, Wattle Partners was founded in its- um, So, you, so that, that's, that also can- Consistent with your deep value philosophy, exactly. you think contrarian, always contrarian. Great idea. Let's start a brand new business with no clients and a whole lot of expenses with our own license. Right after, right when you can't get any capital. Oh, uh, well, you can. It's called the tax office. Yeah. But uh, this is for another podcast. Definitely. Uh, and then, so we've kind of evolved over time. And as as you're referring to, we uh, operate quite a few businesses, all of which come into financial services, but probably the biggest one and, and which we've done a lot of work together on is the Insight Network. So I think like every financial advisor um, and something that XY and Ensemble uh, did incredibly well was there were a lot of informal communities of advisors and different groups of advisors. And we're all having issues, whether it was you know dealing with new clients, finding scalability, finding uh, opportunities within business. Um, and we 
Jamie and I just together decided we should start running uh, educational events or trying to give back to the advice community at the same time. So the Inside Network was founded basically as a event and education uh, business solely for financial advisors. And that's gone from, I think, eight events in year one to 32 events, which I think we'll be doing uh, a few together. Um, Absolutely. And attracting thousands of advisors every year and having since expanded into uh, practice management. Uh, and and by by doing that exercise is but the byproduct being that you've you've been able to use some marketing or media techniques to attract clients to your own business. That kind of came as an accident as well. <laughs> it's, it's a positive byproduct. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of our growth at the moment comes from podcasting, uh, same as yourself. So we have a partnership and we license a group called um, Rask. Yep. You know, you've met, probably met Owen Rask before. Um, and uh, essentially, we put ourselves out there to educate. Our background before that was, this is probably a long story, but our background before that was our business was founded by a guy called Austin Donnelly. One of the, one of the doyens in the 70s. So like 35, wrote 35 books, yep. founded the Australian Investors Association, yep. which just merged with the Australian Shareholders Association. So we always had this background of working with DIY investors and providing a lot of education. And he was he was into um, independence and, and professionalism. FIFA service. Yeah, so wow. We were our, where, where me and Jamie joint was the first FIFA service, or we, we still say that was the first FIFA service advice firm in the country. Yeah. Now, when, every, when was that? Is, uh, Jamie joined in 99. Yep. I joined in 2003, 2004. Well, there you go. I remember, I, I, for, for the listeners who know my backstory, I, I had a, a business and we went... 2005, bit oh, the you're bullet. Compare the dates yeah, and make yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. But we didn't go fully. Um, you know, I have to admit, we were still doing um, insurance and, and 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 taking that remuneration. But um, that was a bridge too far at the time, and and as it turns out, it might be a bridge too far now. And timesheets for a while as well. Oh wow, like that was yeah, not anymore. Oh wow, I think anyone can do timesheets. Yeah, well, that that you were at the CBA, so you had the cardigan, the timesheets. Yeah. Like, <laughs> your office appears a bit more sexy these days. I met an annuity provider earlier uh, this month, and um, I was talking about. When I first joined CBA, basically annuities were flying out the door. It would have been in the early 2000s. Um, so it's incredible how the industry kind of changes and evolves. Well, we're not going to focus on government regulation, yeah. <laughs> but the whims of the government and 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 just the the levers that they pull in their little chamber yeah. um, completely and utterly, uh, you know, in predicates things like annuities. And it's, I think it's providing a tailwind for the advice industry, for better or worse, at the moment. Um, it, it, absolutely, and so we're now back. You, you've, you've kicked off again. You, you, you've started Waddle Partners, um, uh, and yourself was it yourself and Jamie from the get go? Yeah, yeah. I okay. know uh, oh we we had uh, there were about seven business partners in the beginning. Were they um, like all advisors who brought their books in? Or kind yeah, of- so we'd all kind of worked together in that original firm, uh, and then joined again in 2010. Yep. And then for one reason or another, there was retirements. There was people left, and and naturally, have you been in business before? Um, there's there, you have to have a joint kind of uh, mission in when you've got so many different stakeholders with, within, let, let alone outside of business. Um, so we kind of evolved, and uh, most of them have started their own business and and running them their own way. Um, and it's down to the Jamie, Jamie and I who fully own the business, um, and we kind of see each other as complementing really well. One's left, I think it's left brain, right brain. There's big picture and execution, and that that tends to work um, perfectly. We won't we won't divulge which one you are. We're going to let the listeners um, figure that out by the end. But um, uh, I suppose I'm going to try and answer that by uh, asking the following question: What positions you both played um, in the, in the footy team? Uh, oh, I started in a back pocket, and uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, so you're I'm the left sure brain guy, yeah. right? So where's Jamie, Jamie up front? Full back. Oh, full yeah. back. Okay. He, he used to protect me a lot in the <laughs> on the ground. Um, I'm a bit shorter than he's, uh, and then he also ended up in uh, in the middle. So ruck for. For um, there you go. Yeah, you don't have to worry about height. It doesn't translate to podcasts, which exactly. is one of the one of the great benefits. So back to your back back story. Um, yeah. you've been doing that. Um, you're a Melbourne born and bred family. Yeah, doing. Uh, uh, so basically, one of the probably the earlier you know, you know went to Bachelor of Commerce, did all the kind of normal study, CPD, SMSF Association, um, worked through all of those, had the kind of Groundings, and you could see, depending on what your background was, if you're if you're you know a true advisor back in the day, you could see the issues that were coming within the major banks. So I was actually unemployed for six months after spending a year and a half there because I couldn't keep doing the work that I was provided um, at my original employer. And then happened to stumble on uh, 
Jamie's business and other businesses and then that just completely changed your mindset. It's like like the majority of advice businesses are now. They're the, they're the way clients expect them to be run and then the way you expect them to run. You know, it's transparent, it's upfront, the commissions have disappeared um, and it's very much client-centric whereas in the past it was a lot more product-centric. Yeah, that's right. And, and I suppose it's also, um, um, you know, we're trying to articulate the voice of people who actually run the business of the business of, of these financial advice practices. One, you ha- you are an advisor. You started as an advisor. You've now worked your way to managing director, which is, you know, it's quite a well-worn path. I started off doing paperwork. Paperwork. So, you started. So, tell us about that. So, what did you start off doing? Uh, I was a junior advisor to two uh, women within our original business back yep. in 2003. So that was, you know, turning up to meetings, doing file notes, following up application forms. Customer advice trades. records? Or yeah. Was it, was it everything? Uh, and extensive file notes. And our managing director then, Ian Murdoch, uh, was like, there was dictated letters. Like it was true, true old fashioned kind of financial planning advice. And it's just kind of uh, grown, I think changed over time. And I think it's a, I think that career path is harder uh, with the you know the way we progress and how educated everyone is that doing that kind of that um, very basic manual work is becoming more difficult and and you know less people less patient and obviously more talented so um, that's gone but now I can walk out into our office and people have a question something very niche about a application or how X plan works behind the scenes and I can still use that IP it never disappears are you, are you the only guy who knows where the actual physical stamps for Australia Post is yeah. located which draw? Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep fine so um, and you when did you take the leap from being an advisor so frontline advisor within this group to more of a operational and then management and now leadership role it probably kind of uh, gravitated over time because we run a, uh, and own a few different businesses. So we we founded the Inside Network, Jamie and I together. Uh, he's he's spent a lot of time running events and on that side of the business. And naturally, our time was pushed in different directions. So it probably just evolved over twenty twenty uh, as the as the pandemic hit. Yep. To so move up from the client servicing to yep. to truly working out the direction, you know, having a look at where what our messaging is, the type of uh, people we want to attract, and you know who our core client was. So, kind of rethinking that um, on the fly. There was no kind of uh, formal process. It just kind of uh, evolved like it, I think it does in a lot of planning businesses. Well, you, it tends to be that the right people doing the right things at the right time sort of sort themselves out. Yeah. So, and that sounds like what you've done. And extracting yourself, one of the hardest parts, I think, whether it's a practice manager or a MD, is extracting yourself from the day to day at at some level, um, which can be incredibly difficult. Absolutely. And also, um, sometimes it can be a bit of an ego hit. I've said this story before, but um, I was a lead advisor in my firm and made the decision to trans um, to, to transfer my, my client base across to my advisors. And I was, you know, sort of losing sleep around, would the clients take them up? You know, how long would it take? Um, and now I have nightmares over how quick yeah. it was and how, and, 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 and how much important. happier the clients are. Our clients make us feel important. That's yeah. the hardest part. That's right. That's right. So um, now what what group today, um, uh, we're going to talk in a second a bit about, you know, the, the mechanics of it. Yeah. But we were talking off, off air a minute ago and um, you were just sort of rolling your eyes back saying you've got so many uh, leads yeah. coming in. Um. Given where we are in the the cycle, so we've we've well, we're about to hit some tailwinds. We've sort of hopefully we've had the the end of the regulatory crunch. Um, where do you get them from? <laughs> <laughs> they come from uh, everywhere at the moment. We've had success in our partnership with uh, Rask Media. So Owen uh, and I co-host the Australian Investor Podcast, yep. but he has a series of four podcasts. So you're supplying content. Um, people are becoming familiar with you and where you're from, and they do inbound. Yeah, I think it's yeah. As a story, we get. Uh, you know, inbound queries all the time, and then we naturally yep. call every every single one that comes in. And I think it's a story which uh, Jamie talks about a lot, and we talk we we stress this a lot with our team is that in financial advice and advisors know it that a lot of the uh, work is in having empathy and showing empathy and asking questions. And uh, the medium of podcasts or YouTube or whatever it happens to be is a great way to to begin that process. Whereas you know, well, you're subliminally of, building trust. Exactly. I'm kind of hoping the people listening <laughs> are building some trust <laughs> today. <laughs> if if not, if not, cut out at 14 minutes. Because <laughs> we get, I get, uh, I'll call someone. They'll say, oh, "I listen to you while I'm walking the dog." 
and it, it's kind of you start to think about the responsibility that people are listening to everything you say uh, and not that we're providing personal advice on that but um, there's things that you say that people kind of want to execute uh, and it's it is that that you know in normal financial advice process you might only get a one hour meeting to to build that trust but this is an opportunity as as it is in you know providing content being quoted in media uh, to pass to build trust and have that kind of uh, respect or rapport before they come in yeah absolutely um, absolutely and when I um, um, look at the the, the Waddle partners and, and part of it is the sorts of clients that you're after a quick look at your website and you've just said we're going to do some more which we're is doing some work on the website so uh, yeah. um, you've, you've kind of given a type yeah. of client um, but you're going to get leads in from every like all sorts so maybe yeah. if we could just change gears I'd love to hear a bit about the practice so what what type of client does the Waddle partners seek to engage today and where's the future hold for like the, the type of client I think we're like every financial advisor in the last 15 or 20 years that we we tend to be generalists and you would have you would have seen it your business would have been the same uh, you try and do everything you're trying to do some mortgages you're trying to help children you're trying to help 30 to 40 year olds uh, and then we kind of uh, worked out over time that we were incredibly good at retirement and that most of that is due to the the need for you know empathy and not just dealing with the financial side, but dealing with the emotional and other parts of retirement. Um, that's where our most success was historically. It was with DIY investors, but we know DIY investors can be difficult to <laughs> to, to deal with. And, and sometimes you can tell them to, to do it yourself. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so basically, we we only take and all we talk about is retirement. And when you if you think about you running your practice with the sole purpose of helping people in retirement, it means you can specialize a lot. And narrow down and be incredibly good at things like superannuation, SMSF, contribution strategies, uh, investing for retirement. Because we know most of the industry is set up for accumulation. You know, you know, it's fine if you're contributing, still contributing money, and you've got a backup. But once you've got a finite pool of capital, the whole concept needs to change. There's an added nervousness when people can't put in to their retirement; they've just got to take out. And mistakes are a- 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 even more. Um, uh, painful when you've got a finite pool of capital. We've seen it. We've been through, I've missed the dot com just, um, but been through the GFC, the pandemic, multiple, I think it's something like uh, there's been 10, 10% drops in the market in the last 20 years. Um, so it's, yeah, focus narrowing down onto re- retirement. Uh, and so 55 year plus. So just before or? Down to 50 yeah, okay. uh, for, for some people. I know you can't condition of release 60, yep. um, but more and more uh, people are looking to set up for retirement. And I think that because uh, I think literacy, financial literacy is still quite low, uh, there's a big education component from 50 on and the value of, of financial advice in that in that cohort is is significant. Yeah. Um, particularly on, on the investment and strategic side. Yeah, and I think that the, the, the concept that if you're just looking after retired people, your business um, uh, might have a finite life span is just wrong because um, you take them cradle to grave, but then after grave, you then have a pool of assets that you've probably spoken at length about their children and what they want to do with their money anyway. So it's logical that that, that, that outlives them. That's the educa- uh, evolution of the business. So we've done some work with other groups on inter- intergenerational wealth transfer and how do you get involved and how do you engage the next generation uh, in the early discussion. So we're part of wills, we help with estate planning, you help with aged care um, and and we know that that, uh, that wave is still coming. Yeah, right. So let's talk about the org structure of the business. Um, you, you've got some – how many how many frontline advisors? And are you still giving some advice, Drew? Still giving some. Uh, I'm – in every SOA presentation, so myself and Jamie, uh, the principals and and owners of the business, uh, and we're financial advisors. So we do a lot of the uh, you know upfront client client conversations, client calls, initial meetings, uh, and most SOA presentations. Um, and then we've got uh, two financial advisors. We've I think we've doubled our team in the last twelve months. Uh, so two financial advisors uh, joined us. We've taken an in-house or got an in-house para planner. We have uh, kind of a COO um, or uh, a, like a on the tools um, COO, as well as an administration team of about four plus accounts, like a CFO. But they work across each of our businesses. Uh, and the help of a PR team <laughs> at the same time, an events team to run all the events that uh, we run each year. Yeah, right. So uh, they're you... separate businesses. So I think we're about thirteen. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll come back to the question of of how yourself and Jamie can 
manage your time with, with, with being a frontline advisor? And I'll give you the simple answer. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Good people. Good people. Oh, it's trusted. Yeah. Trusted people. Yeah. Um, so, uh, to with the advisor, so do you run, do you run the administration team in, in pods or, or is it a sort of a collective and whoever's got the capacity does the job or what's, what's the methodology? It's as a collective. So, we're looking at different ways because we're seeing so much growth at the moment. So, our business is probably growing 40%. Year on year, that where uh, I've you compare it to like steering a massive cruise ship that you've got on, you've got existing clients and you're dealing. We provide pretty extensive service to them, but you're trying to shift different things and grow your team and deal with capacity at the same time. Uh, so it's a it's a collective. Uh, we have a um, in house manager and then three off you know outsourced staff that um, essentially report directly to her. Yep. But we don't think we've got the perfect solution. And I know you would have seen multiple different types. We're trying something that we think works for us. Well, there's nothing perfect forever. There's yeah. a point in time. So, if you're looking to scale your business up, so I, I, I often get asked to, to pod or not to pod, right? Or whatever the terminology is. Um, putting advisors in a pod where they've got their people can work. But then managing those advisors, four or five different pods and figuring out that there's variations in service levels and- That's our concern. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, that's that one. And it's hard to scale that one. And it's also- fiefdoms, it's, Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's key person dependent. You know, you've got- Let's assume the advisors all stay because quite often they're equity partners or senior. But if you lose, you know, one of your vital team members in an operational capacity, it's not as if the other pod's going to say, oh, I just grab mine. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, so, so um, it's- uh, on those larger scalable or people who are growing at, you know, 40% is really good and that's that's new clients as well. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, a centralized system, but your COO has got to be on top of things. Exactly. Because um, now you're running a logistics business for information. Yeah, and you have to step yourself out of the, the yeah. day-to-day and, and look at capacity and how, you know, how many statements of advice can you produce? How can you keep the quality up? Where do the bottlenecks come is probably where our focus has been. Yep. Lately, looking at uh, our tech stack and um, and how how do you make sure your service offering is what it needs to be, and that it's and then probably even more so is how you, that you're charging appropriately for it. Okay, so let's 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 see, quickly um, scrape a bit of uh, information regarding your service offering, um, clients. So we've got an idea of the sort of client you're after. Yeah. Um, uh, you're geographically located in in in, in the Melbourne CBD, um, but clients across the country, and that's because the media goes across the com- country like this. Yeah, and Austin's newsletter. So I was talking to someone about that this morning. Austin Donnelly, uh, the original founder, uh, ran a newsletter, Investing Times, that was out of Brisbane. So we have probably half of our clients are in either Brisbane, Sydney, Perth, or Adelaide. Okay, um, constantly uh, traveling. So when COVID came and uh, people had to be remote, you just you, you're so used to doing. No one wanted to see us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they might want to come go to Chin Chin. Yeah, that's, most, that's how we get people in. We set you up at the table at Chin Chin, and they'll come see us for half an hour. Classic. So um, the the clients come in. You've got. Um, uh, do you do you call them a certain amount of retained families in in the like what what's your terminology for for um, that part of the business? Uh, we uh, you kind of call it private. Private clients, or yep. we—it's—it's it's just family groups, essentially. Um, and and we're, we're operationally, then, with your, your four advisors, and given that you guys got other things, where are you at today as far as per advisor? And where would you like to go to? It's yeah, it's constant. I mean, historically, our old businesses would never be more than a hundred clients per advisor. Yep, but those family units. Yep. Yeah, and and I think the technology is helping you improve that. I think there was a number that came out recently that's you know up to one hundred and thirty per advisor. But where everyone says they're collegiate, I think we're actually collegiate, for better or worse. If you've seen, you probably haven't walked past Jamie Meyer's office, but we're actually a shared office. So the two of us <laughs> can hear every client conversation and we're across everything all the time. So um, at the moment, we're probably just over a, if it, if it was only Jamie and I as principals, we're over 100. But yep. if you add the new advisors, then you're probably at an average of 60. Yeah, so um, you've got some capacity there. I think a lot. And particularly if your technology and your power planning and your you know your ability to onboard clients is, Absolute, is efficient. Yeah, and look, off, off air, you, you, you were saying the inbound leads and you've, given, you've articulated where they come from, um, but you're going to be full soon. So are you in the market for um, uh, new advisors or, or, or what's, what's – like? I hate Everything. to break it to you, champion, but but if you if if, if you're averaging sixty and you think you can get to one hundred, one hundred and twenty, even one hundred and thirty, you're getting capacity pretty quick. Yeah. So what's yeah. your plan? Uh, I mean, we see owning. We we own retirement, and we're very clear on owning retirement. And because of our client base across the country, we see an opportunity to have an advisor in in every state 
Uh, okay, so ge- ge- geographical, areas. you don't mind. You're agnostic. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And I mean, I'd love to not have to travel as often to some states, uh, but I think we've got you know with our relationship and the business we own in Atchison uh, and the branding and our, our story and our mission and being incredibly clear in what we do. Yep. I think it uh, it fits and there's a place for it in the market. So, I mean, we'd love to be adding new advisors um, and we kind of – our model is very much a, a principal um, and senior advisor model and, a, and kind of a team atmosphere. So, if you're listening and you're in Brisbane, hint, hint, and you'd <laughs> – like to take Jamie's chairman's lounge um, uh, <laughs> membership off him for Qantas. He's happy to give it. Happy to give it up. Yeah, happy to give it up. Um, you touched on something there with with Atchison, and and I'd like to maybe just ask. You know, given you're in retirement, investments is part of it. I mean, this yeah. is this podcast is not per se about investments, but it'd be remiss of me not to get you to highlight what you do because you're that passionate about it that you guys have actually moved and 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 sort of also deep into asset allocation, but I'll let you take over. So what's what's your philosophy on the investment side? How do clients end up getting their money invested? Yeah. I get in trouble a lot because I went on stage for a few of these, you know, podcast events and said we we're proudly boring. Um, not that we're overly conservative. Oh, but- oh mate, the, the people listening, they're voting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if, if, they're st- if you're that boring, they're probably not no, still listening. Be, yeah. Yeah, so. But in, in investments and in retirement, you don't want to be taking big swings. You don't want to be following momentum and you want to be aware of uncompensated risks, if, uh, you know, for uh, lack of a better word, in, in portfolios. So the amount of people that come in that have done it themselves, that's where a lot of clients come from. They had an advisor, they didn't like it or they tried to do it themselves. And they're so exposed to different things they're not even aware of. Um, ours is about how do you build resilience into a portfolio? And it's and I think it's where advice is going and it's why ETFs have been so popular, which is asset allocation is incredibly important. Tactical, tactical asset allocation is, is important and then acknowledging what risks lie within there, but also knowing that you don't need to get the 20% returns every year that if you can actually deliver consistently, you know, 8 to 11% and not be exposed to the vagaries that happen in the pandemic and not be forced to make, you know, bad and emotional decisions um, or, or reduce the emotion that comes during those periods for clients. So, we only got, I think, one phone call to sell during the pandemic. Uh, and I think part of that was- because, Dan Andrews yeah. is a client, is that right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I actually don't know. If he is, I apologize. No, we'll cut that out. Okay. So, um, um, Politi- no politically exposed people. Okay. That's the, that's the one there. Okay. But, but in, in saying that, um, you know, do you use- you, I know you've got SMAs. Or do you have an MDA? Because- being able to be adaptive is wonderful rhetorically, but yeah. being able to then turn around and actually execute <laughs> on those in a timely fashion is another thing. Is that how do you operate with those? Yeah, I think, and it's important to have options for for clients, and that's the way we've built uh, our business. Historically, we're one hundred percent tailored, and we'd execute everything, you know, comset, all that sort of thing, uh, including then, non-custodial stuff. Are you guys? Sort yeah, of so yeah. some on a lot of off-platform yeah. uh, and a, and a combination, and and I mean, most of our clients, you know, two to ten million. So we're not talking about the ultra high net worth. Um, so very and still retail clients. Uh, we partnered with or we purchased uh, Atchison Consultants, so we acquired an asset consulting business. Which that's is- putting your money, that's like the, the, the Oral-B ad, you know, I like the, well, that no, was it the Gillette ad, you know, whatever it is, you put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, exactly. When was that? Was- what year was that? Uh, three years ago. Okay. So, there's some, and you, you, you find out how uh, maybe uneducated uh, on or how much knowledge, more knowledge other people have. Maybe that's a better way to put it. <laughs> when you talk to an asset consultant or deep analysts that have worked in financial services and investments for a long period of time. So, um, we're always uh, tailored and now with Atchison, we've built a series of SMAs that are tailored to our clients. Um, the, they, they range and I think this is going to be important. They range from risk profile models. So, as you expect, we do the entire SAA to uh, individual asset asset class leaves. So, we still have the opportunity if a client wants more alternatives, we can buy an alternatives, like a liquid alternatives leave via yep. platform. Uh, and it's we've got the flexibility and the, and the optionality for clients to build different portfolios and to have control over the SAA or TA if they want to. Yeah, um, wonderful. So, not outsourcing completely. And... Um, uh- Commercially, was there sort of platforms or partners that that one or you either work with now or two that you think are doing a good job? Yeah, I think uh, we're working with Pete Warren. I'm sure you've interviewed Pete uh, from Fenura. 
yep. um, who's helping us rebuild our tech stack on the fly. I think we've got the same tech stack as – did have the same tech stack as most groups, but there's so many – and you probably talk about it a lot. There's so many tech providers in financial services. We're going to come back to the tech stack yeah. question. So, we'll, so he's great. But yep. platform-wise, um, we've used Hub24 and CFS uh, quite a lot. The, the um, CFS the new platforms. one as well? Yeah, the Edge, Edge yeah, okay. platform. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's just the you know you uh, platforms have been great, but the you know we were attracted to Edge because of the you know it's, I think it's the first platform in twenty years and completely new technology at the front of it, um, and we found their being a, a new platform and they're looking to grow at the same time. They've been incredibly supportive in terms of providing resources, providing help. You know. I think we've got our own helpline directly to them whenever we have queries. So um, Okay, well, you've yeah. just ruined their day because <laughs> every other planner is going to say, where's my helpline? <laughs> that, we're going to cut that out. Um, no, Kieran, no. the sound guy? Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 wink, wink. That's all good. Uh, I mean, they're yeah, incredibly good to work with. Um, and naturally, we use... Yeah, we're not we're not doing tech stack, but um, we are. No, we're, yeah. we're, we're parallel into tech stack now because because you, you inferred that because you know we're looking at the engine room and technology is part of the engine. So, what does Waddle Partners use to deliver those? Considering, and also I wouldn't mind just your CRM because you've got a few of the other businesses, and and there might be some commonality of lead gen and whatnot. It'd be interesting to see where you're going with that as well. Yeah, so historically our tech stack was the same as everyone. We had X Plan, like sixty five percent of financial advisors. And a few random things trying to plug into it. Um, so you had Mailchimp, you had some, you know, using X, X plans front end, uh, and this the number of leads we're getting and the ability to automate and and find support and use you know different automations became difficult. So we engaged Fenura to help us kind of rebuild and deal with that. Shout out Peter yeah, Warren. Peter Warren again. Shout out to is uh, and Danny is doing great work for us working basically they feel like they're part of the team at the moment uh, and that's kind of changing the model from uh, X-Plan still being used and, and for, for advice production mainly for advice production and what about yeah. workflow management and stuff like that How so the, yeah the high level will be a Salesforce driven Got lead it. management yep. that then leads into work sorted as workflow and one of our team here Rashana has been working I reckon 13 hours a day building workflows so we're ready to go on day one and then my prosperity is the client facing um, which is owned by Hub24, isn't it? Yep. Uh, as the client-facing part. And I think that's where most or where we've definitely struggled is f- is understanding the client experience on the other end because um, the, the X-Plan login is okay, but there's so, you know, what people are expecting, what they've seen from their banks or their brokers is very different to what financial planners have generally been able to offer yeah. without going custom. So understanding that and thinking about that client experience has been a big part of what we're, we've, we've invested in and worked on. Well, it's been a blind spot, right? Yeah. So um, uh, I think the, there was a transaction. I think Hub, but yeah, they did, they did purchase. I can't remember if it was the last year, the year before, and I think there was a collective kind of um, – Happiness that there's, so a, 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 there's a there's there's a there's a a big a, a big dog with a with a, with a, with capital that can actually fulfil those just unmet expectations yeah. of both the advice industry and the clients. So we saw so many come in, uh, but and, they've, and they've all been because they've, right? they've all been good, right? They've all their intents all been great. It's just cost a lot of money, yeah. And it, it's it's obviously not help when um you know every three months um the government changes a little nuance in Canberra and you've got to go back to coding. Yeah, we went so, to the future proof event. I'm not sure if you saw that last year, and the amount of kind of client facing that that whole conference was basically client experience. How do right. you how do you niche your client and how do you service them and make sure you know they feel loved all the time and and contacted, and the automations and the outsourced investments available in the US is just different six scale um, and I think my prosperity is probably the standout here that we've seen so far oh shout out we uh, we probably don't even need to put that on the links but we're, <laughs> we're going to add a few uh, links there and um, I might even put a, a bit about Austin Donnelly as well because um, you know it's, it, people should actually who are in financial advice in 2024 um, need to really pay homage to people who did things at the times that, that were that have driven the professionalism of, of the industry yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, we can link to his 35 books probably. <laughs> um, come up with. We just published our own. Kieran just fainted. Just yeah. give us a sec, everyone. No. 35 <laughs> links in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, cool. And look, um, other one is uh, just around licensing. Uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but um, uh, you are self-licensed. Um, is that correct? Yeah, three eight three one six nine is our AFSL. It's been the same one since twenty ten. Uh, and Jamie and I own own the business in its entirety. Yep. Um, and yeah, fully self licensed. Always have been. 
Anyone in your supply chain that you'd like to give a shout out to? I mean, obviously you give one to Peter, but any, anyone else or any, anyone who's doing out there who's doing a good job for, for yourself it could be internal as well. Uh, one of your businesses, right? <laughs> so, well, you can if you want. <laughs> I mean, v- VBP has done, uh, you know, helped us helped us with our um, deal, you know, dealing and scaling with the administration side of our business, definitely. Yeah, look, and, um, and VBP is one of quite a few out there that that that, that, that does that. And and, yeah. th- and thank you. It wasn't was <laughs> no, that, that one. Um, no, no, I was asked permission for it. No, no, that's it's all good. And and um, I suppose what what the premise is for anyone engaging in that is that people are people. Um, and if you tr- – we're going to get into people culture right now. Great segue. Yeah. Um, but if you do want to scale your your team, you've got to be good at people um, and you have to be able to have a scale partner. Exactly. And, and that, that, that's the, they're the two things, right? So if you don't want to be good with people and you go to a scale partner, it's not going to work. Yeah. Regardless of which it brand. It just becomes which, harder than having the, the people in correct. your Melbourne office. Correct. And if you want to scale, it's very difficult to do that. Without a scale partner, because um, the lag times of of, of doing the, the recruiting and training and whatnot um, internally uh, just means that yeah, it's a get rich very very slow program. I mean, you're a young guy, but uh, if Jamie was here, he might be saying, uh, you know, we need scale partner quickly, Drew. Definitely, and I think that's and that's where the the future is. Whether it's having a very client facing and service driven business in Australia, uh, but then it, it's not just outsourcing. It can actually be artificial intelligence and and using automation in different ways. Oh, I mean, I yeah. I can tell you from first hand experience that um, there's there's a bunch of people who currently um, do data entry to I suppose mask over the inefficiencies of technology in Australia currently, yeah. who have got one or two degrees and a master's who would love. Artificial intelligence do that part of the job, and then to do more fun stuff. Exactly. Yep. So, so everyone's rooting for it. We ran a training course on that last year for advisors. So, ChatG, you know, introducing ChatGPT, and that was just looking at marketing. There you go. How you could use it to. Jamie does it every night, and he sends me um, plans not 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 financial yeah. plans, but plans, strategies, uh, articles. So this could be the things. podcast where you ask Jamie to not do it as often. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's like I'm struggling to, to watch the end up. of my favorite film, <laughs> Jamie. So uh, and now you can do it. Uh, I think via voice. So yeah, it's it's extended even more. Oh, very good, very good. Well, um, what I always like to to ask is you've given us an overview of sort of the macro elements and the tools that you've got and. And um, but uh, I'd like to ask you three questions. You know, why do people join you? Um, why do they stay, and how are they going to grow? So, from a recruitment perspective, how is people? How have people come to you? Maybe to kick yeah. off that way. Uh, and I think it's a difficult. Some of these are questions you have to ask them at the same time because I can give you one perspective. Theirs could be completely the opposite. I'll just get yours um, now. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let the listeners decide what the they thought. Out, yeah. uh, I think for us, it's been. Uh, because we have quite a few businesses that there is a lot of autonomy and they're exposed to a lot. So they're exposed to events and education and media and podcasts. Uh, I think that attracts people, but we're not micromanagers. Um, so we don't, we don't sit there and dictate that things should be done a certain way. We've got processes, uh, but we're not that, uh, heavy on if that makes sense or yeah, not, not dictating that much. Uh, and we've, no, somehow found a lot um, either via LinkedIn or more recently via existing team members encouraging their friends to join us. Right. So three like or the four. ultimate net promoter score, employee promoter score. Uh, yeah. Is that a flex? Would you recommend your friend or family? Yeah, they're yeah. just here in reception, Drew. They're coming in. <laughs> and it's been three or four you know, people and then interviews are coming from that. So okay. hopefully, and I think it comes down to, uh, which can be good and bad, but we – encourage people so if people find issues or problems we encourage them to find solutions and i think it's making sure people are feeling heard um and i've got a probably a story i shouldn't maybe i should tell we can always edit it out isn't that right kieran you're shaking his head (laughs) not thank you i want to be challenged like i i'm i'm 41. I don't know everything about financial advice. I want to be challenged. And if You've I'm heard it first. Something. A millennial has admitted, has admitted they don't know everything. <laughs> just a millennial. I'm just <laughs> hanging on to that. But I don't know every. I don't know anything. Everything. I know I know enough, but I don't know everything. And they've always got this – most of the people we've got are 35 and over. Um, so, they've got experience and they're willing to challenge their different ideas. So, we've thought about – rethought our pricing, business model, all these sort of things, and they always have an opinion. 
Do you have a formal structure for that? Like, so maybe give us an idea. Um, what's what's the meeting cadence for running the business? So we basically run three meetings uh, a week for Waddle, um, half an hour to an hour each. One's a uh, working pro progress, so that can be we do quarterly reviews for clients. Yep, um, and that's basically administration uh, and advice. We've got a separate advice meeting, uh, and then we've basically got a prospecting and potentials meeting. Yep, and then I'm not in the administration meeting right okay fourth. so prospecting and potentials also potentially links into your other associated businesses yeah. they might say look we've got some lead throw from the, the the media or the podcast the events as well is that right yeah exactly and talking okay. about uh how we've pitched if we you know if if we've lost it haven't picked up you know won a client or lost a client for so learning and reviewing yeah and i think that's part of retention as well yeah. which is reviewing uh and taking advisors on the journey um of client client conversations where we could have answered that question better or you know what was the, what was the issue or what was the pain point we didn't see when talking to that client one of the things i did when i had an advice practice as ceo is um i would always really be keen on doing the exit interviews of clients if they yeah. were exiting they were um um and uh if there are some advisors uh listening to this who were there they um Sometimes those exit interviews with a little bit of empathy and listening to the client and getting to it end up being retention yeah, exactly. interviews. So Most um, of our exits are in a – I won't say what they're in, but um, are actually by – you know, the client dies. So and, and it's more about whether you miss a – It's probably, a, probably a, a black comedy term yeah, for that, mate. I think I they say in a coffin. In, in trustee, well, I think they call it the falling off rate yeah. or something like that. The, so, um, yeah. But um, I'm not. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not insinuating that you dark bugger. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's all about um, th- those ones as well. Now, um, that's your meeting rhythms. Yep. And so, given that you're remote, I mean, you've got a lovely office here. I'm, I'm looking at the, these wonderful people. But your intention is to be Australia wide. You've made that pretty clear. Yeah. Is it? Conducted on like MS Teams, or, or how do you do that? Those meetings with everyone. Yes, yeah, so we have a few offshore staff. Whenever it's uh, everyone's here, it's in person. We're basically, uh, I call it a flexible uh, office. There's no formal work from home. What would you um, like though? At the moment, they're listening. Everyone in the office every day. <laughs> um, I think just because it moves so quickly, and so much is happening that you can be out of conversations quite quickly. Yeah, particularly if you're in a client facing, and pretty much every person here. Is client facing, yeah, and and you very much need to be. But uh, I think we use Teams, SharePoint, and um, link in AI as much as we can there for note taking. Yeah, uh, but what, what do you use for note taking? The Copilot uh, stuff. Yeah, yep. Copilot, and um, when we're on Zoom, uh, there's there's some basic note taking. Zoom AI stuff yeah. comes up, which isn't perfect yet, but uh, Zoom AI actually should just. Put a run through Copilot. <laughs> I'm no tech guy, but I've, I use both, and um, there's my two cents worth. Um, respective billionaires. So you should Zoom should just code via Copilot. Yeah, pretty yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> it's um from what I've seen, but you know it's 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 incredibly uh, fast moving now. Um, that's how you recruit people, which is you know really lovely and warm and fluffy. How do you review them? Like not everyone's. There's going to be times where you've got targets. You've got operational targets. We want this many widgets done by this point. You've got you've got targets. You've got prospecting. You know, uh, how do you individually, as the MD, review your team members? And we just go as open as possible. We we'll, we have six monthly kind of less formal reviews plus a really formal uh, twelve monthly review. Do you have a structure um, for the tw- like? Do you use any third party structures or philosophies? Yeah, we've got a self. Uh, I don't think it's called a three hundred and sixty. I can't remember exactly what it is. Yeah, a lot of them, lot of them go by that. Yep. Yeah. So you get your manage your 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 staff member reviews themselves one to five scale. Got for a number of things, innovation, where their biggest issues are. Their manager uh, reviews that, and yep. then it comes to us, um, and we kind of make an assessment and they build smart goals around that every twelve months. Um, well, they're your biggest cost and by far your biggest asset. Exactly. So far, we yeah. to take a check and balance is is on you. And 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 they no they need they kind of want reviews and they need reviews, uh, particularly when when they have a lot of autonomy. Now, am I in the right direction? How do I make? What is my role? You know, your roles change. Everything evolves quickly. So, um, I think formal reviews are incredibly important. Absolutely. You mentioned earlier that um, yourself and Jamie are sort of uh, different ends of the, the, the spectrum as far as um, left brain, right brain and whatnot, um, which I love. I'm a big fan of, um, you know, whether it be uh, DISC or, or, or HBDI or whatnot. Do you implement any of that with your team? Do you have any psych profiles with, with your team? Not, not yet, but uh, I, I think we try and read them and uh, adjust policies and processes to, you know, I know 
people in our team have similar um, seem similar to me. So how do I how do I make you know how to learn from my struggles in getting beyond you know the detail or and and teach them how to how to evolve. So it's almost more personal coaching, okay, um, and direction rather than uh, psych profiling. But I think as as we grow, it's going to be increasingly important. No worries. And, and um, when when you guys succeed, so say you do have a cracking quarter or, or, or a month or whatnot, how do you celebrate? What's 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 fun look like in this place? I mean, there's high fives, constant high fives. Uh, when a, you know a proposal or a, and I think it, it's incredibly important to. So just to, to clarify, that's that's not that's part not, of the, yeah. the new cannabis <laughs> sort of regime. It's uh, it's the physical, it's a physical old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm old school when it comes to that. <laughs> uh, I mean, we've got. Five, you know, five businesses in house. Yep. So one of the big things we do across those businesses is a monthly town hall, and in each of those months, we highlight someone who's you know instilled the awesome. values of our of our businesses incredibly well. So it's and making sure you're calling out the wins because you know when you when you do so much as as Jamie and I do, you you tend to focus on what's not working more so, and you've probably done the same. But you need to celebrate the wins and and how how well you're doing and how. Uh, team members are improving and evolving, um, and then we own a share in a and a two bars in Melbourne, um, which you may not be aware of. But um, Kieran, we're in. Yeah, we're we, in. We set up uh, tables. Uh, okay, well, links, beds, links. Yeah. First up, which ones? Which ones? Uh, beneath Driver Lane, so it's a, a basement bar as it is down a laneway in Melbourne, and then there's upstairs a bar called Torino, which is more of uh, aperols and and Negronis. But um, it's not all alcohol based celebrations, but there's all kinds of. Uh, unfortunately, we had our, our CFO passed away two or three years ago. And we have a memorial oh, yeah. day where we take yep. our whole team out. And he was loved badminton. So we go and play badminton once a year, invite his family to join us and kind of uh, remember him. But having – and not, not always having – Alcohol driven parties, which I think can be the case, but but sometimes it's just different cu- um, curating just a different environment, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's uh, uh, whenever you're in in your office with those computer screens, yeah. it sort of always feels like work. And encouraging each team and members within those team to put something forward that that was positive in that week during you know it's a, a usually a monthly birthday catch up. Yeah, I think is important. So you've got the weekly uh, town halls. Um, you've got so do you, do you have a so yourself and Jamie owners? Do you run like a, a um like how do you get reporting from each one of these five businesses? Because because you're so busy, like does do you have do they you expect them to give you a report every month or or how does the the sort of you know uh, that information get to you guys? Uh, so we'll have there's a managing director of two of the other businesses yep. as well, um, and we have an exec meeting. Uh, I think an hour. Once a week, okay. where we cover That's off that very really cool. very cool. Okay, yeah, and uh, we have the same CFO across the businesses, which makes you know, you know that. No one can tell fibs. Reporting. Yeah. No one can tell fibs. No one likes that. that is it like, a guy or a girl? Guy. No one likes that guy in the meeting, right? It's like we're thinking of spend. Oh no, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but that's you know the financial parts in- incredibly easy, and then it's relying on you know we have a fairly good structure in terms of having a senior, whether you call it an account director or yep. a CEO type in each business. And they're accountable. Yeah, they're accountable, and you guys are responsible at the director level. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um. The other really cool thing about uh, your your business um, is that you are a B Corp yes. business. Maybe tell me why you did it. Uh, we we off 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 uh, off air. We we both uh, confessed, although I didn't participate in any of uh, the the grind to get VBP B Corp. You said you did it, so why did you do it? I think B Corp's harder than an AFSL audit. Right, <laughs> right. If you've done it before, so maybe maybe just give us the the, the other statement why you embarked on doing it and and and. Um, where does that set you apart? What you know today? Yeah, I think, and you know, the premise of B Corp is thinking about stakeholders beyond your yourself or your, or your business. So, who are the stakeholders to your business? And it's your employees, your clients, and any other businesses you're doing business with. So, um, we did a lot of work in philanthropy originally, and we're on board of a, uh, a couple of private ancillary funds, but also supported quite a few charities in their early days. Um, and a lot of our clients, you know, generally retired and wealthier, we're very interested in uh, whether it's more ethical or charitable uh, giving. And B Corp just kind of stood out to us as, you know, evidencing that we were either contributing a portion of profits to charity or offering some sort of um, service or benefit in that area. Uh, and it, it really came from 
one is a differentiating point, but just embracing the fact that we can contribute to to change, whether it's in the industry or um, in in the world and environment at the same time. I know we're only one little planning firm in Australia. There's 12. I think you said there's 12. Oh, I think there's, there's a them. few. Like, and yeah. A big shout out to all those planning firms who have, who have embarked on that. And, and um, it's also potentially by acknowledging stakeholders, if you – for everyone who's uh, uh, who's an AR, and, and I, I I was for many years, I did the ethics course, the CFP ethics course, and and uh, back then they were that they, they, they part of it was to encourage you to, to have a consciousness about other stakeholders, including the general public, public yeah. perception, um, and you know we're all about the positive evolution, and so by being B Corp consistently, it's a badge. It, it brings you back to making sure that you're always acknowledging those stakeholders. Yeah, and I think like we've done a lot of work on ethical or ESG investing, and I think it's for most people it's a no-brainer. They don't want to support, you know, most clients don't want to support certain things. Uh, and it was kind of an evolution of that, just embracing that we will invest ethically and that we'll, you know, ESG can be a bit of a, you know, is it where moniker is where it, it doesn't necessarily re- reflect uh, any real change depending on what your policy is. So really embracing that and showing our clients uh, that we were worried, you know, we were uh thinking about our impact on everything around us. And that includes, so the policy in there, everything from how do you invest, how do you review investments to you know, what do you do with your electricity, um, what's your policy on recycling, and more importantly, what's your policy with team, with your team, you know, is there outsourcing, is there offshoring, um, how are people paid? Uh, so you you would have seen the questionnaire probably. And yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, as you're talking. Embracing you're, everything. Yeah, yeah, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking and, um, uh, you know, as, as be the, the the front man saying something and making everyone have to clean up after him. I'm thinking potentially Ensemble should do just a, a bit of a series with just the ones to get a, get oh, together yeah. a few of those ones we've got B Corp. Yeah. Um, and just uh, because I think that public perception and when we, we financial planners, I mean, for those listening who are financial planners, it's always been a bit awkward the last 10 years yeah. at a family barbecue or meeting new people explaining what you do. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that that would be that would be very, very useful. Now, you mentioned um, uh, how you've structured um, charitable things for, for your clients, which is really good, and it, it sort of fits exactly what, what those sorts of clients want. But how, how do you do it for your team? So if I'm a team member here, you know, do I get a choice where the money goes? Or like, is it like maybe get a feel for what, what it is if I'm an employee or an executive? Yeah, so we've done uh, both. There, we'll, We've asked uh, clients for, I mean, sorry, we've asked staff for ideas on where our private ancillary funds should be distributing to. We've also done, you know, Christmas donations where we've asked clients which charities from a selection. Uh, but more recently at our offsite, we announced that we'd uh, give every every team member an additional two days off if they uh were to con- you know commit to volunteering or some sort of charity work at the same time. So, and there are things that you know as a financial planner running a business ten years ago never thought on this kind of scale. Uh, but it's it's you, one you, of those no, you did. Great. You're like you can have Sundays. Yeah, <laughs> you can work on the that's a weekend. <laughs> there's, there's a whole there's a whole week between Christmas and New Year's. It's completely yours. But it's it's just like you know the enjoyment and having people want to come to work. And, yeah, and then it also. You, if you visit, we we have the pleasure of meeting charities all the time and hearing what's happening in other parts of the world kind of just reminds us of, uh, you know, our role within financial services and we're, and what, you know, controlling capital or advising on capital can do as well. That's right. And look, if you get off doom scrolling the, the social media and you actually listen to a few relevant news agencies, it's it's yeah. it's not all um, t- uh, beer and Skittles in the rest of the world. It's, exactly. There's a lot of people who need a lot of help and uh, for reasons associated with many things, but a lot of it's actually just luck in Australia. We, we, have, we have the ability to do it. Yeah, definitely. So um, thank you very much for uh, uh, the people and culture. And, and just, just coming back, um, uh, the if you're out there and and this resonates with you, Drew has, has given me permission to say that you guys are looking to expand your team. Yeah, of course. So um, yeah. we'll put some details there, and people can can reach out to you as and, and maybe start maybe start following the podcast if you're not already, because then you get to know the guy, right? So and they that probably won't want to join us. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. <laughs> That's, I think I think uh, I think they get the best thing is they get to make their own decision. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So. Uh, when we kicked off uh, the engine room, we, were, we I was just passionate about shifting the gears to um, highlighting uh, well-run businesses. Um, not everyone in the industry is going to be a business runner, um, and they want to fit into a team. Where do you see the future for advice practices, given you've had 19.9 years experience? <laughs> um, 
And uh, in the context of, do you think they're going to get all big like accounting firms? Do you think hyper specialization is a possibility? Where do you see it? I think from from what we're doing, that specialization is is going to be incredibly important. But I think I can see a smaller group of larger businesses, whether that's through kind of external funding and bring them together, but smaller groups of say five to ten billion dollar practices in Melbourne and Sydney, eight to ten will will I think start to kind of dominate, and probably more from our backgrounds, you know, the you know these retail client businesses rather than the the big old kind of investment bank um, approaches. Not that there's, you know, both those businesses work, um, but I, that's where I think I see the future going. Um, and w- w- I think we've got a model that works, which is this kind of principal advisor model. But um, And the specialization, right? Let's, let's, and retirement. Because yeah. jack of all trades is another way of just saying lower EBIT. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's where you need, every, you need to add more heads to deal with more clients, whereas you can't find efficiencies if you're trying to do everything at the same time. Um, and I think it is very much niche. We talk to other financial advisors and they're all about finding, is it legacy planning, who you really need to define your client. And I think it, it, and um, the US has been incredibly good at it. It could be over there, they niche to, I only deal with executives from a company. Yeah. I don't think it'll be that niche here. We don't yeah. have enough big companies. Yep. But- Retirement, pre-retirement, insurance, mortgages. I just see the future being more niche, and then and you know consolidating. Well, I'll ask a question, um, and you don't have to answer it. But um, <laughs> uh, I'm seeing this, uh, you know, observing really positive communities and trust. And the bottom line is, there's more clients than there are advisors in Australia. So th- I think that's why the spirit of openness is just so genuine. And a lot of open, uh, sorry, orphan clients. Yeah, and, and there's no one, there's no big entrance in there at the moment, but banks and, and, and anyone else really, really polluting that in, in that marketplace. Do you see a, a world where um, you be sharing clients? Because if you look at the medical industry, um, someone comes in to see their doctor and they've got no problems with referring them to a specialist, coming back, referring them out to a specialist. Um, is that something that, that, you see his future, and, and are you doing it now? Like with some of the clients outside of your yeah. So show? mortgages and insurance, we uh, we share with you know friends of the firm or yep. people we've met along the way that were yep. incredibly good at what they do, and it's something we know we'd have to dedicate a lot of time to be good at insurance and to be good at mortgages. So we know that's something. And the hardest part, I was talking to someone about this the other day, which is staying on that course because it's easy to see these opportunities and then pivot your business towards that. But we know where our value is and we know the clients we can add the most value to. So, yeah, I see it as working with other groups. And uh, the I guess the, the big, I think someone explained as the rump of clients, uh, which is like the, this is, you know, five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars or maybe it's three hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars and how do you service them because um, naturally we attract a lot of clients from with different asset levels but how do you service them not profitably as a business but actually add value for the fees have you got a plan bring? for those no we don't no. No, <laughs> that's so, where you need to partner with someone and yeah it could be bringing someone in-house yeah or it could you, be finding another firm you could have an, it's like an incubator, right? So, um, you know, a lot of practices um, who have uh, clients in the demographic you're after, they're, they're, the parents still wouldn't mind their 35 year old kids to be in the stable as well, but you just don't have a model for it. So, what can you do to keep them happy until they get to that stage where they, they fall into your thing? Or, or do you partner with people, which is what you're insinuating? And I think a lot of it is there's incubating them in investment. Product. So having a small investment that's you know uh, engaging on one side, or which there, there's improving options there. I think SMAs might help with that. But it, it is, and part of the Insight Network is meeting other advisors, finding people who are like-minded, and potentially having uh, you know partnerships or ways that we can either bring people in or or you know work closely together. You know, it's for clients that we can't add value to because every advisor we meet, you know. We don't see us as a competitor. I don't think they see us as competitors either. Look, I'm thinking on, I'm thinking on the run here, and let's try and solve the problems well. So, um, where the friction happens there is, and and this is if if you're an AFSL land or ASIC and you're listening to this, um, I'm, I'm going to just put this on you. Um, you're a, you're an advisor, and, and you've taken a, a, a client on um, inside your AFSL, and you've done all the right things. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you identify that a colleague, so unrelated, um, that has a skill set, and they're also a financial advisor. Um, for a particular client or even your client for a particular part of it. Yeah. Right now, it's messy Very because messy, yeah. the, the new AFSL tr- has to treat them like you've never spoken to them before, you've never been briefed. That 
that inability for AFA cells to have trusted, sort of uh, a trusted link that's acknowledged by the government, I think is just needs to be remedied. Have you got a plan for that? That's what we're about. I wish I, had, I wish I had a plan, but uh, I did, and as you see more niching, and we're going to need more of that. Um, I think we we've started it reasonably well, I, and I know referral fees uh, are, are outlawed, which me which is a, a good thing because you know you can't incentivize or you know pay yeah for referrals that way. Um, but the, the, and I think the industry generally is collaborative. Um, but that's a sticking point. Yeah, that's sticking. You know, you could solve that. Um, Andrew Derrimuth, yep. <laughs> leading leading economic advisor in your firm. So maybe um, next time I'll, I'll, I'll interview we'll get a Andrew. proposal from him. Yeah, that that would be very good for those who know know uh, if you're uh, wondering where that uh, that comment comes from. Look, um, I'm going to thank you uh, for first of all hosting me down here in in lovely Melbourne on a beautiful sunny day, cloudless day. It's um and uh, in a, in a wonderful location with a lot of warmth and a fair bit of humour and. You actually even lent me your tech, so uh, um, I don't know who's interviewing who here today, but I've had a great time. Um, I know that we're going to be catching up more and more in the future. I appreciate you trusting me uh, today and also in other other ventures, and, and, and we really enjoy um, businesses like yours, but also people who put themselves out there, people who are building communities, people who are doing different things. You are the people that, um, pe- that financial planners find aspiring, and whether or not they tell you, Sometimes I mimic you, right? And that's that's also a compliment. Yeah. Oh, we. I mean, appreciate being here. I, you know, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and all, like all the businesses we run, are all about trying to grow financial advice generally. And I think it's done a lot. We've the the industry's done so much in the last five years. So I think there's a great two decades left for me. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to thank the Waddle Group and Drew for a great time, and um, for everyone else. Um, If you've got through this far, which I hope you have, um, welcome back to the Engine Room. We've got lots more really interesting and rewarding guests in 2024.